Hey everyone, this is Brady, the Game Dev Artisan. In today's video, we're going to continue our series on Godot fundamentals. We'll be covering the basics of GDScript and how to use it as our primary scripting language within Godot. GDScript is a scripting language built specifically for Godot, has been built to work directly with Godot's features and APIs, and is the recommended scripting language to use when getting started with Godot. GDScript is designed to be easy to learn and use, making it accessible for beginners while still offering flexibility and power for more experienced developers. GDScript is a dynamically typed language, meaning that you don't have to declare variable types explicitly. It is similar in syntax to Python, which makes it relatively easy to read and write. GDScript supports object-oriented programming principles, allowing you to define classes, create objects and instances, and work with inheritance and polymorphism. One of the advantages of GDScript is its tight integration with the Godot engine. It provides direct access to the engine's features, allowing you to easily manipulate game objects, handle the user's input, manage scenes, perform animations, and so much more. GDScript also has built-in support for signals, which facilitate communication between different objects and components within your game. Overall, GDScript is a versatile and user-friendly scripting language that empowers game developers to create interactive and engaging games using the Godot game engine. To begin with Godot's GDScript, we'll be continuing with our tank scene where we add a new script. We'll also be adding functionality to our weapon, as well as creating a new bullet scene. While creating our tank script, we'll be covering some of the GDScript basic syntax, such as comments, statements, indentation, how to declare variables, their types, as well as some basic variable manipulation. Within our weapon script, we'll also cover enumeration, custom functions, as well as how to attach signals to existing nodes. And by the end, we should have a moving tank, the ability to rotate, rotate the weapon, and fire around. So let's get started. Let's quickly address our blurry sprite that we have from the last video. We go to Project Settings, and scroll down to the Rendering Texture section, there's a default texture filter set to linear by default. For pixel art, we typically want nearest to be set. This will give us our crisp pixel art look. And to begin, we'll go ahead and right click on our tank under the tank scene and add a script. We'll call this tank.gd under our scenes folder. You'll notice by default, Godot adds a boilerplate template for us to get started. Now for some cases, this might work perfectly. But for our cases, we're gonna modify it quite a bit. Let's just go ahead and delete it all. Let's first talk about some basics with GDScript. With GDScript, you can use the Script tab to edit your script or an external editor. For beginners, I would recommend sticking with the built-in editor. And for our tank to function, I'd like for it to move forward, backward, be able to turn left and right, as well as to rotate the weapon that we have attached as well. To do so, we can describe some variables for our direction of our tank. We start by describing a variable with the var keyword and the name of our variable, in our case, direction. We can also define what type that this direction variable is going to be, by setting a colon and the type that we want. In our case, we want a vector two. And we can set this equal to a vector two pointing to the right. Now, when we use this variable later, Godot will know that it is of type vector two. There's also a shorthand that you can use in lieu of adding the type, where when you say equal, you do colon equal. And this will infer the type from the value that's being set now for our movement, we want to be able to move forward, backward, we want to be able to rotate, and these things are going to be done at set speeds. The best practice is to not use magic numbers within your code. To prevent from doing that, we use a trick called constants. Constants use the const keyword, and then the name of your variable, typically done with uppercase. We'll use a speed example here, set this equal to 64 by default. You'll notice I use dot zero, that defines it as a float. There are various data types that exist, such as integers, strings, floats. Take a look at the documentation for more. Now, in addition to our speed variable, we also want another constant for our turn speed. We'll set this to 2. And our rotation speed for our weapon. We'll set this to 20. Now, in addition to constants and local variables, we may also want to create a reference to a node within our scene tree. There are several ways that we can do this. One common way is to export using the at export annotation and then the var keyword, followed by the name of the reference variable name, in our case, weapon. Now, if we're typing this, we can set this to the node's type, which in our weapons case currently is a node 2D. We'll change that later. But if we save our tank scene and we click on our tank node, you'll notice that we now have a new tank section within our inspector panel with a weapon property. If we select assign, 
it pops up with a filtered node list from our scene tree and we can select our weapon scene. This will assign our weapon node to our variable reference of weapon within our script. Another way to do this rather than exporting for the variables is to use the onReady and set the variable reference directly. The annotation for onReady can be set manually by typing at onReady, the var keyword, the name of your reference, let's use body sprite in this example, and we'll use our inferred syntax here, and we'll just grab our body sprite. A shortcut to this is to click and drag your scene, such as the animation player, from your scene tree onto the line, hold control, release, and it will auto-complete with all the syntax you need. We'll do this one last time for our collision shape using the shortcut. Sometimes you want to rename your variable something meaningful. I like collider instead of collision shape 2D. It's a little bit shorter. Now let's cover functions within Godot. You can define a function with the func keyword, followed by the name of the function. Godot has a built-in function for most nodes called underscore ready. You'll notice that as we type, the autocomplete shows. We can select that from the dropdown. This function behaves similar to the at on ready annotation, so we won't actually need it in this case. For our tank, we'll be moving it during the physics function, which is built into Godot. We can define that with our func keyword, underscore physics, underscore process. You'll notice that there's a delta property that's passed into this function. This variable holds the delta between frames of each physics process. Inside this function, we'll be defining our behavior for our movement. For now, we can pass using the pass keyword, which will allow us to continue writing our code without syntax errors. Next, we'll also want to use our input function. The input function is also baked in and we'll pass in a event property. We'll be defining this for our action when we want to fire our weapon. For now, let's go ahead and describe what's going to be happening within our physics process. We'll add some comments to better understand what's happening. To begin within our physics process, we may want something like an input direction so we can determine whether or not we're moving forward, backwards, rotating, and so on. We can do this with a variable called input direction. We'll infer its type, and we'll use the input class. It has a get vector function. This get vector function takes in four parameters, one for each axis on the positive and negative side, and it will compute a vector two containing the movement that's being applied to those inputs. It'll make more sense shortly. Before we can do this, we need input actions that map to the keys we want pressed. To do this, we return to our project settings, and under input map, we can add some new actions. In our case, we want a turn underscore left, a turn underscore right, a move forward, and a move backward. We'll also be rotating our weapon. We'll go ahead and add a rotate weapon left, rotate weapon right, as well as a weapon fire action. You can quickly map these by clicking the plus button and the corresponding button on your keyboard or gamepad. Turning left, we'll use A. Turning right, we'll press D. Forward, we'll use W. Press S. Rotate our weapon left, we'll use Q. Rotate right, we'll use E. And to fire our weapon, we'll use space. Now back to our function, we can describe those actions as parameters, such as turn underscore left, turn underscore right, and on our X plane, we'll use our move vectors, move backward and move forward. You'll notice that the properties that we're passing in is also being described here in our type hint. Let's go ahead and expand our editor for better view. Now, once we've received this input, let's check whether or not it has an X vector and a Y vector. We can use this control flow if statement by checking if the input's direction X plane is not equal to zero, meaning that there's an input being applied across our X plane. And if that's the case, let's add a comment here. We want to rotate our direction based on our input vector. And we also want to apply our turn speed. To do this, we'll set our local variable called direction equal to a rotated version of direction that is gonna be rotated by our input direction. We'll use the X plane. We'll multiply this by pi divided by two, which is about a quarter turn. We'll be applying this at a rate of our turn speed over a number of frames using delta to smooth it out. Once we've done that, we'll also apply that rotation to our rotation variable from that direction's angle. Now for forward and backward movement, we'll check our y direction. If our input y direction is not equal to zero, we're gonna set a comment here that we want to move in a forward or backward motion and play the animation. Here we can use our animation player local reference. We can say play our move animation. And for our velocity, we'll be setting this to a linear interpolation of velocity, combining our direction in a normalized state, multiplying that 
by the input direction along the y plane, and we'll multiply that by speed over a course of speed times delta, again, smoothing out over the course of frames. And if that input y is set to zero, we want to bring our tank to a stop. We do this by setting velocity equal to vector 2.0. For our animation, we'll set it back to idle. Once we've applied all our velocity changes, we can use a built in function to apply our movement using the move, move and slide. Next, we can apply our weapons rotation based on our input of our weapon rotation vector. Going for this using the same method as before. This time, we only want a single axis, so we'll use the get axis function. In this case, it'll take the rotate weapon left and rotate weapon right actions. We'll then take our weapon, and set its rotation degrees, we'll add an offset using that rotation direction, multiplied by our rotate speed, multiplied by delta over time, multiplied by i. Great, let's move on to our weapon. If we add a script to our weapon, we'll call this weapon.gd, also saved in our scenes folder. And for this, we can add the class name of weapon. By adding class name to a script, you improve better integration with Godot's engine, such as autocomplete and better visibility. And for our weapon, we'll want to track what state it's in. We can do this by creating a variable called state. Now, let's cover enumeration. If you look at our enum keyword, we can give it a name of something like states. And in here, we can declare a specific state for each mode that we want our weapon to be in, such as ready state, a firing state, and a reloading state. Once you've created this enum, you can now type your state variable to only accept values that are inside that state enum. And we'll set this to a default of states.ready. Now for reloading, we'll want to add a new node. Get the timer node, we'll rename this our reload timer. Using our shorthand trick, let's drag our reload timer into our scene using the control shortcut. We now have a reference to our reload timer within our script. Let's also create a custom function. We can delete these ones for now. We'll call this change state, and it will receive a new state of type states, meaning only state enums are valid. And inside here, we're going to set our current state equal to our new state. A custom function like this allows for us to add additional functionality later down the road, such as observing the state changes as well as emitting signals. Now, in order to use this weapon, we'll add a new function called fire. And inside our fire function, we want to check whether or not our current state is already firing by checking if state equals states.firing, or, and these two pipes represent or, state equals states.reloading. If that's the case, we don't want fire to do anything, so we'll just return. Before we start firing, go ahead and change our state to inform our system that we're currently firing, and later, we'll come back and we'll write logic to create a bullet at our position, and we'll set its direction. Once we've done this, we can go ahead and set our state to reload and start our timer. Let's also cover signals. Our reload timer is set to one second. When it completes, it will emit a timeout signal referenced on our notes tab under the timer. If we double click the timeout signal, we can tell it to connect to our weapon script under a method called underscore on underscore reload underscore timer underscore timeout. You'll notice it automatically creates the function definition that we can replace with the body of our function. In our case, we just simply want to change our state back. To the ready state. Now, in order to do this, we need to create a bullet. In our scenes folder, let's go ahead and create a new scene. We'll call this bullet. Use a lowercase. And for our scene, we'll use an area 2D. This will allow us to use collision detection, which we'll cover later. We can rename our bullet scene, bullet, add our collision shape. We also want a sprite for this, just so we can visually represent it. Sprite 2D. Now, under inspector, you can create your own texture, or we can use a placeholder texture. And describe its size. Three pixels should be fine. If we go to our 2D main screen, press F and zoom in, we should see our three pixel wide bullet. For our collision shape, we can add a rectangle shape 2D and set its size to three pixels as well. We'll also want to set a script for our bullet. We'll call this bullet.gd. And for our bullet, we'll have it move at a set speed. Again, we can use constant variables here called speed. We'll set this to 500. We also want an internal variable called direction, it will be of type vector2, we'll default that to a blank vector2, and on the physics process, we're going to just simply take its position, we're going to append, based off the direction, in a normalized state, multiplied by speeds constant over time of delta. This should move our bullet 
if we return to our weapon scene, when we create our bullet, we we'll want to reference a packed scene. You can do this in a number of ways, but a best practice is to create an export reference to your bullet scene with a type of packed scene. From here, we can select our bullet scene and drag it over to our bullet scene property. And inside our fire function, we can now add the functionality create a bullet reference. We'll store it in this bullet variable name. We'll set this equal to the bullet scene instantiated. This creates an instance of our bullet scene stored in our bullet reference variable. For our bullet, we'll set its direction equal to a vector two from our current angle of our global rotation. This takes into account our weapons rotation as well as our parent rotation from our tank. We'll also set the bullet's global position equal to our global position. Once we've set the variables, we'll add a comment here to say that we want to add the bullet, the root scene, so that our translation is in world space. We can do this using the get tree function, access the root property, and call the add child function, passing in our bullet reference. This will add the bullet to our scene tree, and translations that occur will happen within that world space, not within the space of our weapon or our tank as it rotates. Now, if we return to our world scene, we can remove our sprite 2D and bring our tank scene into frame. Then when we first save and run this, we'll notice that our tank is extremely tiny. So let's go ahead and correct that back in the editor. Under project settings, under your general tab, go to your display window. And let's modify the viewport width. For my purposes, I'm going to set this to 960 by 544. And under the stretch mode, I'm going to stretch for the viewport. This should work. We'll rerun our project. We have a better view of our tank. And if we test our controls, W for forward, S for back, A to rotate left, D to rotate right, Q to rotate the turret, E to rotate the turret right, and space to fire. Doesn't seem to be working. If we return to our tank class under our script, notice under our input, we never called our function. So last thing we'll do is update our input function to say if event dot is action pressed, we use our weapon fire action name. If that occurs. Then we'll call our weapon reference and say fire. And you'll notice that as we were typing fire, we didn't get it on autocomplete. This is because if we look at our weapon, we're referencing a node 2D. If we go to our weapons class, we added a class name of weapon. For our tank's type hinting, we can specify that the weapon reference is of type weapon. And in doing so, when we call weapon.fire, you'll notice that the engine detects the autocomplete or the fire function. And if we now reload our project, we can test pressing space fires and requires for us to wait for that reload to occur. If the editor is throwing errors before you run your game, you'll see them here in the output log while you're working. That can be great if you have simple typos or missing properties or the like, but sometimes you'll need additional output that can be done in the form of a function. For example, if I wanted to know what my input direction was, I could add a print statement using the print function and passing in my input direction. Now, as I move my character around, it will output my input here. In addition to the print function, we have a built-in debugger. There's a lot of functionality within the debugger that we'll probably cover in a later video. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like a dedicated video covering the debugger. So there you have it. We've covered the basics of GDScript, including syntax, variables, functions, some basic control flow, object-oriented principles, signals, and a bit on debugging. Continue to become familiar with GDScript by practicing within your own projects. As always, refer to the documentation for help, and if you have further questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below or join our Discord community to dig even deeper. And join us next time as we cover a little bit more on collision and physics, as well as some intermediate practices within GDScript. And if you found this video helpful, please feel free to leave a like, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. And stay tuned for further content. Thanks for watching, and happy coding.